anybody else to join us? Okay, I think we'll uh, we'll make a start then. Um, so yeah, welcome to HEPFest, everybody. Um, HEPFest, for those of you that don't know, is a week-long online festival for students, parents, carers, and teachers and advisors. HEP is a partnership between the University of Sheffield and Sheffield Hallam University, and we aim to encourage more young people and adults to consider higher education opportunities. It also delivers the South Yorkshire UniConnect programme, HEPSI, in partnership with local schools and colleges. So I'd like to thank you once again for coming along to this particular session, which is the last session of our week long HEP Fest. So I know on Friday afternoons it's sometimes difficult to get that energy to uh, to do your work, to join extra things. But a um, big, big thank you for joining us. We have our wonderful local neighbour with us, who is also from a UniConnect programme hop, and they will be more than able to introduce themselves shortly. And they're concentrating on a session called Connecting with Your Future Self, which will begin in just a second. Just to let you know that this session is going to be recorded and it will focus on the speaker rather than the gallery view. So just for all of your awareness. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to hand over to both. I think it's Fiona first and then her colleague David will be joining us both from HOP, who is going to take you through this wonderful session today. So over to you, Fiona. Thank you very much. Thank you. I could have the first slide then, please. Thank you. Of course. Give me one second. OK, there we go. So, yeah, thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining. Um, as it's been said, it's we, we've joked amongst ourselves, we've got the graveyard slot for the Friday afternoon. So thank you so much. Very appreciative of you all being with us. So, yeah, so I'm Fiona Berry. Um, I'm from the Humber Outreach Programme and my colleague David Stapleton will be speaking very shortly. Um, we are um, one of the 29 UniConnect partnerships throughout England and we're actually based at the University of Hull. Um, our session today for HEPFest is all about connecting with your future self um, and it's that way of starting to think about the future and hopefully making sure that you feel supported and confident as you travel forward um, into your exciting futures that lie ahead. Next slide please. So there are three main aims for this session and um, the first aim is to clarify and help you connect with your future self. So to start to really discuss about those future pathways and the journey ahead. We're then going to focus in on understanding what this mysterious imposter syndrome is, and more importantly, about how you can challenge those feelings of feeling sometimes as an imposter. And thirdly, we'll end the session with some top tips about how to create a roadmap where you can link your present self to your future self. Next slide, please. So what do we mean by your future self then to help clarify what this means? Um, it doesn't matter what age you are. Um, we all have um, visions of ourselves in the future. We all dream. It's com in a completely human condition. And what we can often do is utilise these images to really motivate ourselves so we can start to head towards the like to be self. What would we ultimately like to be like? What would we like our career? What would we like our lives to be like? But also as part of that, it helps us to almost rule out the things that we don't want to be, the things that we'd like to avoid, like to avoid in ourselves. So it takes account of your expectations. And the way to do this is 
to start to visualise a clear pathway towards the ultimate end goal. If you could click for the diagram, please. So this diagram here is often how it helps you to shape in sort of like a Venn diagram type of way where we've got the light to be selves, the ultimate things that we um, at the end of our rainbow, the ultimate dreams that we have. On the right hand side, we've got the elements of the light to avo avoid elements of ourselves. And then we all have that middle section, which is probably the likelihood of what will be our probable selves, which won't be perfect one way or another. It will be a combination of many other things. One more click, please. A thinking task for now and to take away for later is to consider these three things about your future self and or what that may, might mean for any future career. What you may become, what you would like to become, and also importantly, what are you afraid of becoming? What are the things that would be not on your wish list that you would definitely want to avoid? And either now you can do a quick sketch now or in your own time later on, you can complete multiple versions of the diagram above because what's important is that you don't just have to have one vision, one visualised diagram of a possible future self. You can have many, many different um, variations of this diagram for all the different possible pathways that you may want to go down. And importantly, you can change your mind. You know, just because you put something down on paper as how you're feeling today or during this academic year, what you think you're uh, connecting with your future self may look like, it doesn't mean that is set in stone and you have to um, adhere strictly to that. You can change your mind. And often pathways, as we'll talk about at the end of the session, can be very winding. They're often not very, they're not linear. You know, you can go back on yourself. You can go round and round a little time before you get to your ultimate destination. But whichever way you approach this, however many variations of this diagram you do over time, the way you are motivated helps you connect everything together. Uh, the next slide, please. So the next middle chunk of this presentation is about this mysterious imposter syndrome. Um, it's sometimes referred to as having that feeling of being um, a space invader in terms of you feel that you're in a scenario or a situation or at school or college or potentially in the future at university or in a workplace where you don't actually feel that you sh you feel that you shouldn't be there. You feel somehow that you're invading that space, that you are in some ways an imposter and, sh and, and don't um, have the justification to be in that space. If you could click, please, for a definition. So two psychologists back in the 1970s um, coined this phrase, imposter syndrome. Um, and you can see there, they're overarching definition is that internal experience of intellectual phoniness in people who believe that they're not intelligent, capable or creative. So it's that sort of inner voice that niggles away at you saying you're not good enough to be here. You don't deserve to be at this institution. You don't deserve those exam grades. Um, other people are better than you. And Despite being coined in back in 1978, um, there's still loads and loads of research and work going on about those feelings of being um, an imposter. In layman's terms, on an everyday basis, it's that sinking feeling that perhaps you're a fraud at school and not on your educational journey, regardless of your ability or attainment, you doubt yourself. You doubt whether or not you should be where you are and whether other people's expectations of you are not justified. If you could click again, again, please. So there's a thinking task for now, or again for later, that this idea, this feeling of being an imposter is universal amongst all of us as humans. It's a fundamental flaw in our human condition that we often doubt ourselves. And if you have had those feelings or feeling that now, that's perfectly normal. 
you know, people always, we, we doubt ourselves and we, we overly sometimes criticise ourselves. And that is completely normal. Everyone feels like that. And there are lots of famous examples Barack Obama, the uh, former president of the United States of America being one, for example, um, he often felt that he was almost overachieving and one day he would be caught out and somebody would question his ability. So even when you've reached the pinnacle, as Barack Obama did, um, it doesn't matter where you are and what job you do, those feelings of sometimes feeling like an imposter are perfectly normal. Importantly, though, and hopefully you'll get this from today's session, that there are ways in which you can challenge those feelings of feeling like an imposter and there are solutions to those feelings. Sometimes those uh, ways to challenge it can be with other like minded people in what's called an affinity group. So, for example, when when I went to university many, many, many moons ago, um, I was one of very few people from my school who went to university and I felt very confident in school. But then when I arrived in a university setting, I didn't have any um, real life comparisons to make. And I sort of felt a little bit out of my depth. Um, so I aligned myself and I had an affinity with other like minded people who came from similar backgrounds. I was from a very rural area. And so it was easy to make friends who had those similar background experiences. Another way in which you can challenge imposter syndrome is to have a mentor. Now, that might be uh, someone else in your family. It might be a teacher at school. It might be the head of sixth form. It might be your form tutor. Um, it could be um, one of your subject teachers, for example. Somebody who can help support you and mentor you and guide you through those feelings. And also one thing that we're, we're not very good at, and I don't know whether it's a, an English British trait, but we don't often very, we don't shout about the things that we have achieved and the things that we're good at. So one way to challenge is to um, actually not be embarrassed or afraid to write down any accomplishments um, maybe perhaps keep a diary of all the things that you have achieved and just to prove to yourself that you, you have every right and you deserve to be where you are. We haven't got time to watch it today, but there's a really good um, TED Ed clip. There are links there. And I know when the recording is shared later, um, you can watch this clip in your in your own time. So taking those things together, then sort of connecting with your future self, challenging the idea of being an imposter. Remember, it is good to dream and imagine a positive future self and try and allay those doubts that sometimes being an imposter um, can supersede all other feelings. Next slide, please. There's just a little diagram here that I, I, I came across um, based on psychology and um, the science of people. And the, uh, the blue circle there is often how we think of ourselves, how we perceive ourselves. And sometimes, you know, we're a quiver, quivering wreck inside. We might give a, a very hard confidence shell on the outside. But inside, it might be an awkward, crazy mess of an individual who tries too hard to impress people and has no talent. Sometimes we doubt ourselves. And that's how often we think we come across to the world. However, the yellow circle are the external people looking in at us and they just think they don't see that quivering mess. They just see a pretty cool person. So I think that's important to bear in mind that sometimes how we perceive ourselves is not always the perception that external people see us. Next slide, please. So what we have here is five broad characteristics of different feelings, different characteristics of you may have felt or you may come on to feel um, these as an imposter. Then underneath each broad characteristic, each one comes up with something in italics, which is about actual steps that you can take to challenge that mindset. So if we could have the first one, please. The first one is the perfectionist. So you may identify with this type of person that you want to be the best at everything um, and you beat yourself up because it's not perfect all of the time and you want it to be perfect all of the time. Um, 
what you've got to think about is if you are a perfectionist, feel free to have high standards. That is really valid and a good trait to have. But actually, don't beat yourself up and don't feel ashamed when you fall short. So if you're not a perfectionist, you may be this next characteristic. The next one is you might identify as being this type of person, the natural genius. Things come relatively easy to you, but actually you've got to be aware of that real success sometimes takes time. And if you're faced with challenges along the way, rather than giving up before you've even started, see those challenges not as an opportunity for you to fail, but actually they are opportunities to learn and grow, to so try and embrace them along the way. Strive for mastery, but realise that it takes time and effort to get there. The third one, please. Some characteristics is um, being the expert of so many things that actually you become to the point where you try and be the expert in so many different areas that you end up not mastering even one of those areas. So you can't possibly know everything. You don't need to know everything. The trick is to overcome this feeling is to know and find someone who does know what you don't and embrace that and realise that knowledge never ends, but you can still value knowledge. You don't have to be the expert on ev absolutely everything to feel successful. Fourth one, please. The rugged individualist. I like this definition. This might be a bit like me. Um, identify the resources you need to do your work. Smart, smart and competent people know how to ask for what they need and find people who actually do know more than them. And it's not a weakness in any way if you put your hands up and say, I don't know this or I don't know how to do this, but I think I know somebody who does. Um, and be proud of the fact that you can do things yourself, but also realise you don't have to. There are lots of other people out there who can help and support you. And the fifth characteristic is the super person. And I think many of many people on the call today will recognise this in themselves, that sometimes in that eagerness to please, um, you sign up for absolutely everything and you, you never say no. It is OK to say no. In fact, you do need to do sometimes. You do need to say no. Um, and it's about being able to order yourself and remove unnecessary tasks and prioritise the things that absolutely need to be done to get you to this stage on your future self pathway. But recognise you don't have to do it all. But what you can do is strive to do your best at multiple things, but also rely on the expertise of other people. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight and some solutions to some of the challenges of what imposter syndrome means. What I'd like to do now, the next slide, please. Um, I'd like to introduce you to David Stapleton, who's one of my amazing colleagues at HOP. Um, and he actually is a real life imposter. And if you can just make out the little cartoon image there of the flamingos, <laughs> The flamingos are all facing one way and a bright pink. And there's David, there's the little seagull standing on the back of one of the pink flamingos facing the other direction. Is not pink. Um, and David's going to explain to you and give some real life insight of what it's like to feel like an imposter. Over to you, David. Well, Fiona, thank you. What an introduction. Uh, so hello, everyone, and thank you for listening. Uh, my name is uh, David Stapleton, and I was an imposter. For the longest time, I thought higher education wasn't for me. Sometimes when I thought about it, it seemed that going to university was something that other people did. Other families, people from other places, people from other backgrounds. I never knew anyone who had gone to university, which looking back was strange because a lot of the people I knew seemed clever, keen and curious. So I think I had this unconscious idea that I'd end up doing something similar to what my friends were doing at school, maybe a bit better, maybe less well, but something similar. Um, above all, I thought the world was only what I thought it was at that time, 
and there were no other options. And I was wrong. So let's rewind a bit. As a child, I had the greatest curiosity for reading. I wanted to learn as much as possible about as much as possible. Uh, books were my thing, and I used to spend as much time as I could in the library or with my head in some adventure or book about the world. I think this led me to be uh, a bit excitable in class, perhaps not the easiest child to deal with. By the time I was a teenager, though, things had changed a lot. My parents were divorced. My home life was quite turbulent. I narrowly avoided homelessness. At school, the local comprehensive, I was even less easy to deal with, even though I was still intellectually curious. Um, and as a result, I didn't get really get any careers advice. So I left that school and I joined the army at the age of 15, back when you still could. That was something that my father had done. And although I thought I could do better than he did, as every boy you know, thinks he does at that age, I suppose, I was still unconsciously thinking in the same patterns. Now, joining the army was something you could do without qualifications, and you could still have a great time doing it, which I did. But even then, there was only so far you could go. If you wanted to become a captain, a colonel or a general, you needed to have good A-levels or even better, a good degree. So my ambitions were already capped at a certain level, something I didn't really appreciate when I joined. So I began to feel restless again and left after about six years. Now, after I left, I came back to Grimsby and faced uh, a very difficult jobs market in the 1990s. There wasn't much you could do locally without A-levels or more. So I went to sea for a few years and had a, quite a few jobs. And then I met the woman who's now my wife, who told me to get educated. But here's the thing. No one in my family had been to university and only a few of them had gone to college at all. School hadn't prepared me to think about my education. But more importantly, I hadn't been trained to think of myself as a student. And this is where the imposter syndrome kicks in. The idea that uh, you can't really succeed there or that's for other people, not for me. Now, looking back, what I had to do was construct my university future self to think about what I could achieve, why I was nervous, but also what I could bring to the table. I talked to friends and family and let them know that I was going to be an undergraduate student, which was a surprise to them. So I took a deep breath and went to my local college, signed up for an adult education course and then on to Lincoln University while working part time and studying in the evening. Not an easy thing to do, if I can just say it's much better to stay in college and get your grades the first time. But going to university was a revelation. For the first time in my life, I was able not only to study what I wanted, and that was English literature, books, poems, plays, films, theories about culture and language. But also my voice was heard in the seminars and classes. When I put up my hand to speak, people listened and responded. Not always to agree, but that was the best thing. Being challenged to grow, being supported to learn, and then to use that learning was an amazing thing and something that did wonders for my confidence. I spent three years being intellectually stretched, but also being allowed to make my own mark on the subject, to develop my own opinions and be expected to communicate them and to debate, none of which was encouraged in the army. Not only that, but I was constantly talking to professors and lecturers on my subjects and having my opinions challenged in a logical and supportive way. The same with the friends I was making there. We used to talk constantly about literature, go to the theatre, nights out together and generally support each other. I also discovered a lot more about the wider world from lectures, talking to students from abroad and immersing myself in literature from around the globe. So eventually I'd finally caught up with my university future self and my uni imposter was banished. I eventually earned a first class degree in English. That was my passion for books, plays, poems and films coming out. Then studied the teaching qualification, then into university lecturing and education management in some major colleges. I was finally in the right place for me, somewhere I could work to help people and have a fulfilling career. 
but it still took a while to shake that work imposter feeling. I compared myself to people who'd gone straight to university from college or had been doing this job for decades. And I always thought pretty soon I'll get found out and that'll be the end for me. But do you know, it actually wasn't like that. Going through higher education through university gave me the same tools as everyone else. I had a solid grasp on my subject and it feels really great to, to know what you're talking about and have that recognised by others. On top of that, though, all of the skills I gained by debating, putting my hand up, being challenged, knowing more about the wider world led directly into the workplace, the great skills to have. So that allowed me to earn a great living in a field that's important to me to make a difference. And again, that feels good. Now, I've spent the last 17 years working with adults in higher education. I've learned so much from uh, from students that they're curious, they're keen, that they don't like being talked down to or given easy answers. And this is what makes higher education such a special and invigorating environment. I finally met my future self, the one that was a result of learning, training and taking on new challenges. The one who was actually my real self, not the imposter. I earned my place as you will too. And I moved with confidence into my dream career, as you will too. What I've learned above all, though, is that you have to learn to think of yourself as a student, as an undergraduate, someone who's made a commitment to learning. And this isn't always easy if you come from a background where going to university is an unfamiliar experience. So that's my story. But what about you? My advice find out as much as possible about what's out there in higher education. Get as much support as possible from as many people as you can. So HEPFEST, UniConnect, HEPSI and HOP are all there so you can get the right information and build your confidence. Start to speak to family, friends and teachers about opportunities. Don't worry if no one around you has done the same thing that you're thinking of. You can be the first. This is where getting advice from teachers and outreach services like Hepsi and Hop are really useful. We can show you what's actually possible and help you make the choices that are best for you. Also, though, look at examples of people who've done really well in the field that you're looking to study, whether medicine, arts or business. Don't assume that they were born to succeed. They probably started from where you are right now. And this means that it's possible you'd be surprised at the journeys to success that many of the highest performers went through. And the thing that's common to most of them is that they went through higher education, worked really hard, and then used what it taught them afterwards to succeed, and also to enjoy what they do. A little secret, sometimes having that imposter syndrome, this feeling that you're not uh, where you are because you deserve it, and that you're going to get found out, sometimes, Having the imposter syndrome is an indicator that you're stretching yourself, that you're taking on new challenges. You're maybe in unfamiliar territory and the old rules don't apply. It's the same if you audition for a dance troupe or a sports team and then you go for your first performance. You'll usually feel like you're an imposter when you're outside of your comfort zone. And we all know that the best things happen when you're on the outside of that zone. So the next step is to dust yourself off, gain your confidence and to embrace your future self in all its glory. Above all, know that you can do it. Get the grades, plan the journey to higher education and begin to take those small and regular steps to making your dream come true. Because the bigger you dream, the better the payoff in the finish. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Fiona. Thank you. Well, thanks ever so much, David, for, for sharing um, your very personal story. And I think that is important to, to hear real life experiences of people who have felt like an imposter at various times, but also David's alluded to that future self and the idea of a journey. So that leads us nicely to um, our final section for today. If I could have the next slide, please. So to conclude with our, for, with our final aim for today, it's all to do with connecting your 
future self and how do you get there and how using those uh, tri ti tips and tricks that we've uh, alluded to today. One of the, the, the e easiest ways to help you visualise putting some of your dreams and your ambitions into reality is to create and actually physically draw out um, a future pathways roadmap. Um, it can be very personal to you. Um, it can be designed in any which way you would like. I've given a couple of examples at the top there and then there's a, a zigzaggy one at the bottom. Um, it could be that your future pathways roadmap has um, traffic lights. It might have uh, roundabouts. Um, it might send you back at various stages um, round back to where you began. It might hold you up at a red traffic light or just an amber traffic light just to get you to pause and think. No, no one's path, future pathway is going to be exactly the same as anyone else's. It's a very in, individualised um, destination. But the important thing to think about with your future pathways roadmap is linking together many of those things that David uh, so eloquently spoke about. Take some of those things that you absolutely love and enjoy and are your passions. In David's case, it was English literature. If David was going to draw a retrospective roadmap for his journey to his future self, getting to university and beyond, it, it wasn't a straight linear road. It began in one direction that took him to the army for a, 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 a space of of several years and then he rejoined that path and moved on in another direction and I think that's a really important message to get across that it is a journey and there will be um, trials and tribulations along the way there might be roadworks there might be some very hilly dangerous roads to navigate but if you know what your ultimate destination is that you think I want to go to university, to higher education, to study for X, because I've got this passion about that. Along that journey, you can ask for help in lots and lots of different places. As David said, Hop and Hepsi and your tutors and teachers at school. If you could click the slide, please. So as you can see, with the, the, the first indicator there is What's often very useful on creating your future pathways roadmap is to put certain markers or checkpoints along the way. Um, so it may be that you're beginning your road just as you are in year 10 or year 11 and you haven't yet completed your GCSEs. It might be that you're starting your roadmap um, at the college sixth form level with A levels, T levels. Um, wherever your destination begins, try and put different markers and checkpoints along the way so you can almost have that reality check to keep reminding yourself about the future self that you ultimately want to be. So if number one, for example, on the checkpoint is your GCSEs in year 11 and your nearly halfway through year 10 at the moment, you've got that bit of road journey to navigate and travel. So your, your first aim is going to be your GCSEs. But if you've got number five further down your road is the ultimate that you want to be a forensic scientist. You've already got those ideas. You've got that love and that passion for that particular um, area of study. You can start doing research now for that ultimate aim at the end for your future self. So you can ask the experts. You can start to do research, as David mentioned, um, about which universities um, offer those particular courses that you, you've got a passion in, you're interested in. You may have more than one at the moment. You may have none at all. So try and keep your views open. But if your ultimate aim is to get to higher education, you can add to it and, and develop it as you go along your road. The next point, please. So as you go along your journey, as you go along whatever your individualised, personalised road, future pathways roadmap looks like, 
all the time think about those motivations and link back to one of the first thinking uh, task activities was about the future self, what you would like to be in the future. Also, don't forget, importantly, those things that you would like to avoid yourself becoming. Um, and somewhere along the line that it will meet in the middle, it be, might be, end up being a combination of those things. So look back at that first thinking task to help you along your future pathways uh, roadmap. And the final point for your roadmap is taking into account all of the definitions, all of the different broad characteristics and how to challenge those, whether you were um, you see yourself more as a perfectionist, uh, whether you see yourself um, as someone who is um, a natural genius, whichever one of those broad characteristics you recognise in yourself, remember there are ways in which you can challenge that to channel your motivations. And listening also to David's personal journey there, don't be discouraged by those imposter syndrome feelings. As David said, that sometimes I can give you that extra spark because it means that you are being challenged and you are questioning where you are. Is this where you want to be? Um, there's no right or wrong. There's nobody's going to say to you, your destination has to be X. It has to be this. You're in control of that. But you can use those feelings of um, sometimes perhaps feeling a bit underwhelmed sometimes perhaps feeling a little bit less confident, twist it on its head to make sure that you've got that roadmap visualised in your head, hopefully a big physical drawing as well, which you can help, help you put markers on, and that will help motivate you uh, towards the end. So, as I said, there's no right or wrong, and you'll be pleased to know my final slide is coming up. So if I could have that, please. Thank you. So just to briefly recap, where we started and where we've ended up. So we began with that idea of what is your future self? And it's great to dream and it's great to be ambitious and motivate yourself and find out along the way, how do you get from the beginning point on your destination to the end? How do you make that future self that you're beginning to start visualise and materialise? How do you make it a reality? And to help you do that, don't forget, there are people to help you. Lots of guidance along the way. Ask lots of questions. Do lots of research. If you're lucky enough to have people that have had similar experiences to you, ask them about it. How did they feel? And the important thing to remember is that everybody at some stage in their, in their lives will feel an imposter. And you might get over that feeling of imposter syndrome and then you might have another um, career change later down the line where you start again and you think, oh, should I be here? Am I as good as everybody else? So it, it comes and goes imposter syndrome, but no, you can challenge it. And finally, we ended with the roadmap. Try to link that connection to where you are now to your future self. And if by constructing a roadmap, you can have those markers along the way and overcome any bumps along the way. And perhaps sometimes you might have to start again before you can get going again. That's absolutely fine. Everybody is individual. But one my final takeaway piece of advice today is um, there's loads and loads of support and people out there who can help you and guide you and point you in the right, right direction and you can also change your mind don't think just because you've committed one concept of your future self that it's set in stone and it can never be changed you can have multiple multiple reincarnations of whatever your future self um, would like to be um, I'd like to end by just thanking David once again Thank you for um, HEPFest for having us. And if there are any questions, we'll take those. Just a little thank you from Hop there. There's some of our social media handles. There's an email contact and our website where we've got lots of information about Pathways to HE, graduate, uh, graduate careers, all sorts of things that you can uh, delve and enjoy. So once again, thank you very much.
Yeah, a big, big thank you um, to both Fiona and David for taking the time to be with us this afternoon and presenting such an amazing uh, presentation. I think connecting with your future self is something we never really have time to do, you know, to actually stop and think and, and make a bit of a, a plan forward and, and think about the ambitions and goals that we want to achieve. So, yeah, it was really uh, useful to hear some of the tips and tricks that you can put in place. So thanks for that. Um, I'm just going to go now to see if there are any questions in chat. So, yeah, there's a question here for David. Mm -hmm. So did you run into any conflict between your military training background and your university mm -hmm. studies? And if so, how did you reconcile these differences? That's an excellent question. And probably probably wasn't an easy one for me. Um, the army teaches you many things: um, enthusiasm, obedience, resilience, all, all these sort of things. But doesn't really concentrate on analysis, um, working together with people, allowing other people's viewpoints and stuff. And I think I think you're right. There's a little bit of a decompression period, I think, between leaving the army and and getting to university, which which probably helped. Um, but I think probably university paradoxically was the best place for me to transition from that army mode, if you like, to being being an educator because there was such um, an open environment for me to um, be very sure of myself and put my hand up and say, I think I think it's like this, you know, and for other people gently but logically to say, no, here are alternative viewpoints and to have that sort of um, you know, organised by a professor or a lecturer, so we can all see where we're coming from. So at university, there's a real great environment where you're you're invited to give your point of view, and then invited perhaps to defend it and to, to realise other points of view and to use evidence and so forth. So I think that was a real part of the journey. But initially, it was it was a very very big jump. I think the thing that probably did it was that was the passion for my subject, which I developed in the army and afterwards, which for me was books. Um, so I that, that there was always um, a point of connection with somebody, you know, whether it's a book, a play or a film, and they helped me to, to sort of really get my head around critical analysis, different points of view and so forth. So uh, it, it, it worked, but uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. That's really interesting. Um, just to come back to another question then that we had before, uh, the question is, what do you think is your top tip for success for students? That's a difficult question. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it is, because I suppose it's that, how are we defining success? Is it academic success? Is it personal success? But I think for um, students who are currently studying at the moment, whether that's GCSEs, A-level, T-level, BTECs, as they remain, um, I think for them, is not to underestimate all of the other things that they have in their lives as well. Because when you start um, applying to university, whether you have to submit a personal statement, for example, it's all about other life experiences. Yes, academic success and particular grades for certain courses um, are non-negotiable, and that should be a great motivator to know that I, you need X grade to study study at this university for this course, but actually for personal statement and in the future for um, applying for actual employment and jobs, it's those um, life skills, those employability transferable skills. So as David has just an, just answered there, uh, Ruben's question about military to university some things did cross over quite nicely some things were new and discreet but I, th I think not not just young people I think grown-ups adults where, where we don't we find it a bit embarrassing as I mentioned before to actually say oh I'm really good at this so if you um are part of a dance troupe or a football team or you do babysitting or you dog sit or you help an old lady down the road with her groceries, all of those things that you probably don't think have got any value have got value because it, it, it makes you that rounder person. And that's not just to put stuff on your personal statement. I'm not just saying that. Um, 
but universities are looking for those transferable skills, people who um, get involved in other things outside of academic studies as well. So that's, I know it's a, it's quite a huge question, a tip for success for students, but I think it's important to not underestimate yourself and don't undervalue the other skills you've got over and above any academic and attainment uh, achievements that you um, succeed at. David, what do you think to that? Oh, that's excellent. I, I would only add really is getting um, your friends and family to respect your boundaries as a student. Now that might be kind of easy if people are expecting for years that you're always going to go to university, they pack you off, see you in three years type type of thing. But but maybe if you're the first in family, or maybe if you're still staying local and commuting from home to the university, it can be difficult for friends and family to adjust to the fact that you're a full time student and you've got commitments and you're you're going places, especially if you're a carer, especially if you've got younger family members around. So it really is up to you quite early on to set those boundaries and say, yes, I'll be there for you in the evening or, or at the weekends or so on. But in these times I'm studying because it's important, because it's for me, because this is where I'm going. And if you can get that sorted out quite quickly, then you should always have the space, uh, the mental space, as well as the resources to make sure that you've got uh, time to study. Yeah, could I just come back in on that? It's actually going back to something you talked about in your story, David. Um, about because you were and many of you on the call might have heard this expression before that you're first in family which means that nobody in your um, immediate home um, has been to university has gone to higher education so often if you're the student in a first in family situation it might be that you for the first time as the child actually have more understanding of the next stage in your life than your parents and carers have had experience of because they haven't had it themselves and David you mentioned it didn't you that nobody in your family had gone before so they hadn't experienced the application process for university what does it mean to go on open days and camp visits and what is the UCAS deadline and so there was nobody that normally would be your first trusted person to go to to ask for advice suddenly probably for the first time you couldn't go to them for advice so it's about seeking out other people who've got advice um, and and can give you that support and guidance who've got that knowledge and um, how did you go about that David if you if you were first in your family how did you find out about university application process what the courses were all about what was your well, situation? I, th I think a couple of things. I was a little bit older when I went back. So I yeah. think I was really, really nice. I had a supportive wife who basically would slap me around and say, right, David, come on, <laughs> you know, uh, let, let's get educated. So I'm really grateful for that. But also my local college was fantastic in that um, once I displayed the enthusiasm and, and haunted around and kept phoning them up and stuff, they, they would t sh say, say what's available, but also put it in contact context for me, which and I think colleges are a lot better at that nowadays than it yeah. was you know when I were a lad as they say back back in the day you know I think colleges are, are wonderful places where there's lots of support available but what what in my experience what the careers teams and what recruitment teams and what outreach teams work from is enthusiasm um, mm -hmm. so you as a student whatever it is even if you think it's maybe a silly idea or you're not sure how it could work if you take that enthusiastically to a member of the career staff or the outreach staff then they can really work with that they can really mold it mold that idea go away and give you some really sensible advice about how to make it work brilliant that's brilliant yeah thank you very much both of you for that that's really really insightful and i think what i heard both of you say there it's it's you know also recognizing what what skills you have isn't it you know and and the things that you do that sometimes on a daily basis we just take for granted you know things like adaptability resilience and and sort of thinking in your head okay so when have i proven to myself before in the past that i've that i have done those things and that's the way of kind of identifying isn't it those transferable skills that i know fiona was talking about mm -hmm. earlier on so yeah, really insightful. Thank you so much both for your time and thanks again to everybody for joining us. We've just mm, got a couple of things that we would like to do to finish. So one of my trusty colleagues should any minute be launching a poll where we would just like you to answer a couple of questions really, really short. It'll take 
um, not even 10 seconds. So that will launch in the chat shortly. And then you'll see the QR code on the screen there, which is for our survey on all the HEPFest sessions that you've joined this week. And you can either do it via the QR code that you can see on screen right now, or via the link that's going to be sent out at the end of the day, either of those. Obviously, with any uh, programmes like ours, we do have to feedback the impact of the work that we do. So it is so, so important to us that we get some evaluations back and we get your feedback so we can learn, improve and work out what went well and, and where we can, you know, do bits to help and, and address what schools want and need. So I will leave you on that note. Um, thank you very, very much, Fiona and David, again, for such a great session. Thank you, um, thank you, everybody that has joined us today. Um, if you do have any questions, obviously there's a link there on the screen now. And we hope to see you again soon. That concludes our HEPFest uh, festival completely. So thanks again and have a lovely weekend, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Joe.